Doublelift is safe. He's still surviving. It's two kills. Team Liquid. I do believe they die. It's three LCS titles in a row. They are the super team. Origin are crumbling to G2. Europe kneels to its champion. G2 Esports. The world awaits G2. Probably one of the best League of Legends weekends just went down, and I'm so ready to break it all down. Welcome to Esports in 30. I'm Lisa Duan. This is Matt Hempstead, and we've got a lot to talk about today. Matt, we have LCS finals, LEC finals, LTK finals. Tell us what went on. There's a lot to talk about in regards to all of these finals. And we had world records, we had old champions return, we had reverse sweeps, and there were a lot of interesting picks as well. So we're going to have to talk about a whole lot of things today. And if you like drama, it was there. Domination, it was there as well. At the end of the day, we've crowned some spring split champions, and it's going to be amazing to watch them all battle it out at MSI. No idea who's going to come out on top. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we get to MSI, OK? Sorry, Lisa. We need to actually break down the regional results right before we bring in a friend to chat the finals let's check out the LEC final highlights between G2 and Origin I feel like the right now the not level oh, oh right. there's the flash crescendo a flashless Patrick gets chunked down. Afori runs for his life. That's the onslaught of shadows used. I'm waiting to see if Cold goes in. Mithy's in trouble. Mithy's dead. He's killed by one that abounds inside the pit. Cold, can he steal it? No, he cannot. G2 get Baron. Cold goes down. All right, Patrick has got his flash and his cleanse available. Here comes Alfari. That's at least one level of engage. Cosmic Radius remember still on cooldown, but Alfari so, so low. One, two, three kills for G2. The re-engage from Wanda. He is just destroying Origin. And G2 ace Origin. This game came down to one that Baron call, but it was the wrong one for Origin. G2 go up 1 0 in the finals. The fact that they gave Cold the Rex side, but he doesn't get to just power off. All right, there's an early flash from Perks already, but look at the turnaround damage. Mickey's going low, defensive flash. Mickey survives. First blood picked up by Perk. This should just be an easy setup. There's the dash, the knockup, the ghost water dive. Blue in prison, just missing, just going wide. One that takes a little bit of damage from Patrick, throwing out the overload onto the overload. I believe that might be the quickest. We're going to confirm with stats. Look at the re-engage. Cosmic Ray to buy some time. Slicing Maelstrom does so much damage. Imagine if Origin were not 8,000 gold down. They've got themselves a one for one. Here's the re-engage. Mithy gets chunked out. The knock-up and the dash away from Mickey. Now Wonders are going to run down the rest of the team. Mithy gets popped. The shield from Wanda. The dive from Caps at 24 and a half minutes. G2 Esports funnel their way to victory. Teleport already being channeled. The knockup from the Umbara will not find a target. Here comes Cap to the skies. Puts the hammer down. Alfari gets a chilling smite from Yankos. Cold shock blasted in the bottom. He's trying to escape now. That's a flash board from Cap. One, two kills to G2. Until now. Mickey goes in with the Abyssal Voyage. Patrick is already chunked down very, very low. Whirling Death will fly out and come back and way too late. Now Nuketag jumping in the back. Pop Blossom from Perks. AP Nico does so much damage. Nuketag unable to kill Mickey. The cold goes down. Caps puts the hammer down. Cataclysm from the end goes, picks up another. Perks picks up a third. A Fori gets the base. The team before 20 minutes is looking for it. G2 Esports are looking at the Nexus. Origin, they're trying to fight back, but they cannot do it. Origin are crumbling to G2. Europe kneels to its champion. G2 Esports, the world awaits. G2. Europe. G2 Esports are your champions! G2 Esports won their fifth EU title, and they did so in a dominant fashion, taking down Origin. To help us break down this series, we have analyst Michael Veteran Archer joining us. How's it going? Hi, it's going good, it's going good. It's going better than it uh, went for Origin yesterday, I can tell you uh, that one. <laughs> so really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so right off the bat, G2 looked completely unstoppable. So explain to us just what makes this team so friggin' dominant. 
Okay, so this is probably the first instance of a super team we've had where mm. it hasn't been a super team that's been reliant on any sort of specific style. So any any previous super team we've had in most regions has been pretty one-dimensional in a certain aspect. Like they figured out a way that works for them to play the game. And this is how most teams have kind of developed over the years anyway. But now we're at a point in League of Legends where a lot of teams have figured out the fundamental reasons behind how to get like ahead in the early game, how to get ahead in the mid game, how to get ahead in the late game. Um, uh, and G2 is a team that has both the best players and had like the best team play in Europe from almost day one. So it's very, very, it presented a very unique challenge to the region. If any team was going to beat them, it was probably going to be Origin because they had the smartest lineup, but they clearly weren't enough. They didn't take a single game off of G2 in the entire playoffs, and they actually played them twice because of the weird format that we had here. So they're actually 0 and 6 versus G2 at this point in the playoff games. Yeah, a lot of analysts always credit, you know, just G2's lineup up and down. They always win lane, and then yeah. it always just carries over into a, a win from there. But, I mean, um, when, when you have a team that can just win every lane, how much does it just open up everything else for them? Because, I mean, if you win lane, it's pretty win, lane, easy just to, to go on from there. Exactly. You'd be surprised. There, there have been plenty of teams in plenty of regions that have just piled all the best players into one team. And one one version in Europe that I always remember was Alliance way back in the day. And that took like an entire split before they ended up actually being a good team. They were like a fourth place team when they initially came on the scene. Uh, and that was after a very shaky regular season. You had OMG in China, which didn't even qualify for the World Championships. It had Uzi, I Cool, uh, Go Going, all these like really big names. And the last time SKT did a super team, they lost to Samsung in the finals of the World Championships when they had Huni top and all that. Um, so it's actually quite rare for teams that have like insane high resource players in every lane to actually be such a strong, phenomenal team itself. So that was really unique to G2. You'd think it would make it easier, but normally it makes the resource allocation like a lot more difficult. But I think one big thing that this team had that most of those teams didn't have was that the Dare jungler, Yankos, has all always being one of the smartest junglers uh, in the region. This is actually the first time he's managed to hold the trophy. Uh, and he was actually the guy with the most games that hadn't won a trophy yet at 333 games until he took the trophy uh, in this series. And yeah, so hats off to him for that. Uh, he's been in the game for a while and he's always been one of the best junglers in Europe. And, you know, if, if, if he was going to win it with any team, it's really good that it was this one. Wait, so do you mainly credit Yankos for the success of G2 or who would you give, I guess, that credit to? At this point, it's really difficult to give the credit to any yeah. singular person. Uh, Wonder had shown some of the yeah. best top lane performances yeah. in the West. Uh, Perks roll swap to AD carry <laughs> and still somehow is taking on like the best up and coming ADs in the region. Like Upset, Patrick, you, you would figure one of these guys would be taking the title for sure. Uh, or Reckless even when Fnatic got better in the second half of the split, but Perks was able to take on all of them and at the very least hold his own if not not win each time. Cap's got MVP. Mm -hmm. uh, Mickey X has always been like the best mechanical support in the region and now he's paired with an AD carry who isn't just mechanically good in perks but has also always been very vocal which has always been what Mickey X has been missing. So like it's really difficult. All of these players have had games that they have carried uh, so you can't credit one singular person here and again the team as it plays is actually very intelligent. It's not just brute forcing their way into it. You can't just beat them in lane and then win because they have actually lost early game a couple of times they aren't the best early game team in the league but they always find a way to come back and now with this finals they've shown some really innovative strategies against some of the mainstay strategies we've been seeing across the region so they look very very scary yeah, I want to get into some of those innovative picks um, because in, in that game too, it was no one was expecting what we saw, right? It was this crazy throwback to the funnel composition of 2018 where Caps was playing Pike and, and Yankos was on Morgana basically soloing bot. So how did they get this composition to work and is it basically just a counter to the Sonoteric that Origin was trying to run or is there more to it than that? I think it was, uh, by and large, a counter to the Sona attack. Um, and one good thing about uh, the Zyra Khan lane is that it, it's still a very, very versatile lane, so if Sona attack wasn't immediately picked, they could still put it bot lane, and it's still like really impossible to do anything against it once it hits level 6, and it's generally easy against most lanes to be able to all-in on level 6 as well, so if Sona attack wasn't picked by the enemy team, I assume they would have just gone standard. Um, but 
in terms of funnel, G2 were one of the best funnel teams last year, and they also had perks playing uh, the AD carry funnel role uh, in all those games as well. Uh, God bless anyone who voted for Yanko's POV like I did, by the way, to see him go support <laughs> again, like he did for much of the first half of Summer Split last year. Uh, the really good thing about the way G2 play Funnel is that they play it more to collapse rather than just to get like as much gold as possible. So they'll shove out mid lane, they'll run to a side lane, and they'll gank that side lane. Uh, and they'll translate that into objectives really, really efficiently. That's always been the big difference between a G2 funnel and anyone else's funnel, where everyone else's funnel was just an AFK farm simulator. They were really aggressive at it. And if you do this against the Sona Tarek that really wants to hit two items, it can be really, really beneficial to you and you'll steamroll ahead before uh, Sona Tarek's able to do anything. They're not able to get any help from their midsection. Their top section's completely dying. I think Rise was a huge factor uh, in that composition because they kept collapsing on the Rise lane and eventually no one on the enemy team could match the Rise and Rise hit his ridiculous sight and spikes. That champion is absolutely disgusting. <laughs> That's why like you saw it banned a lot in the NA series. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I really liked the idea. Um, if any team was going to bring it out, it makes sense that it was G2, to be honest, given their prowess on it last year. And I can just imagine all the MSI teams watching and thinking, oh, great, now we have to learn how to play against this thing again. Yeah, it's back. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's switch focus, because we have to talk about Origin. Yeah. Now, they did beat Fnatic to get to this final match. However, obviously, they got stomped. So what does OG need to do at this point on to improve and you know potentially take down G2 in the future? Oh, that's so difficult to say because <laughs> when it when it comes to because when it comes to especially like game two for example, how how were they going to even know that that strategy was coming into play? The reason that they lost the first series was because they had uh, they have this strange propensity to go for every single Drake that they possibly mm. can. They have a really really good setup to do so every time, but they're they're constantly like going for Cloud Drakes, for example, when they don't really need to, and then G2 were using those moments to take towers around the map, get their first recalls off, and then, uh, you know, get back on the map first and take control, and it was hard for Origin to do anything in those scenarios, uh, even though Origin had, like, a way better scaling composition the first game, for example, which was the only game that they were really winning in that series, uh, they weren't able to actually do anything because of this. They kind of actually fixed that in the series versus Fnatic, so I thought that this series would be a lot closer, and then it wasn't. So yeah. uh, there's clearly like a lot more uh, that they need to start focusing on if they want to go against G2, but it's really difficult to say what that would be at this point because there, there were things G2 were bringing out here that just no one expected them to bring out. Uh, it could even be as simple as maybe they have to start prioritizing red side because these guys were constantly going for red side first pick, and it seemed like there were a lot of answers on the side of G2 to this kind of high tempo early jungle play that they had that that origin didn't quite factor in for but overall it's difficult to say because you can't just say just get better at the laning phase because a lot of the times they were just starting to lose the game out in the laning phase before any of these innovative strategies could start factoring in uh so it's really difficult to say g2 look really unstoppable in this series uh, yeah. my previous suggestion clearly wasn't of being enough well, that's the thing, right? Because I think after the series, the analysts and everyone really in Europe were Absolutely. talking about how G2, this G2 might be the best squad that we've ever seen in Europe. Yep. Um, do you agree with that? And how do you think they will hold oh. up internationally? Yeah, it's tough. It's, like you compare it immediately to Fnatic 2015, right? So yeah. Mm. Yeah, so Fnatic 2015 is the one that everyone will always hold as like the gold standard because yeah. they had the 18 and 0 run. But kind of like every year, the best team in Europe is better team than the last year in Europe because our understanding of the game just gets better and better every year. So it's a bit of a misnomer. I will say though that the gap between G2 and everyone else at this point is definitely comparable to 2015 Fnatic. Um, and I think that with, if we're sending this lineup, there's definitely a very good chance that we can uh, take on SKT and take on the people who I think are our real rivals at this point, uh, which is whatever team the Chinese decide to send against us. We actually have a very long history of uh, 
randomly stopping China's uh, hopes and dreams at international events. And in fact, this G2 roster's done that twice in the last two years, yeah. uh, taking out the RNG uh, lineup last year at the World Championships, and the year before that, taking out WE at MSI 3 to 1, which was uh, not to say anyone expected to go uh, in G2's favor. So I'm hoping we can definitely do that again at the very least. And then it's uh, down to see what they do versus uh, SKT. The SKT series versus uh, Griffin <laughs> showed that there probably wasn't as much talent on the side of Griffin when it came to the playoffs as we thought. Griffin kind of beat themselves more or less. So it, I'm, I'm quite hopeful actually to see this G2 line go against all these guys, especially if they're willing to take out stuff like the funnel on an international <laughs> stage. And we can see what else kind of innovative strategy they had in mind. Perks didn't actually play an AD carry in the AD carry role the entire series it's versus Origin. True. He played AP carry when he actually went bot lane so there's a lot there's a lot of diversity going on here with what g2 can and can't bring out and it's very difficult to prepare for yeah. which is what really got origin in this series well g2 is definitely going to be a fun team to watch Absolutely. at msi yes. um before we go all international though we have to get caught up with the lcs so let's check out these highlights from team liquid versus tsm for the spring split title sweep to put a bow on what was possibly the best LCS finals ever. All right, veteran, how did Team Liquid bring this back after dropping the first two games? 
very, very, very frustratingly. Uh, <laughs> they managed to bring it back with a combination of a Skana pick that TSM didn't really quite seem to have an answer for. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of misplays from uh, TSM as the uh, series mm -hmm. ended up going on. Uh, there really did seem to be kind of like a reverse mental collapse uh, during this series. It was quite strange for me to watch because the composition TSM were bringing out in the first game seemed really, really suited to a particular playstyle that North America keeps showing. It's a very, I guess you could say, team fight oriented region mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it didn't quite work out as the series went on uh, which for me was a little bit frustrating because I actually uh, put money on TSM I don't mm. normally watch the North American region and uh, yeah uh, it was very one until uh, halfway through the third game so there you go so going into it why did you think TSM was a team why why so much money on TSM uh, well, okay, so I haven't actually followed uh, North American region as a whole too much this split, but I have worked with Sven before. Uh, he was actually on uh, the first team that I was in, and I looked at the roster and I did a pretty simple calculation that there were uh, three Europeans on TSM and only one European on Team Liquid. <laughs> and, uh, it, looked like it, it looked like that calculation was going to be completely oh correct for a while. Uh, but there you go, it didn't quite work out. I also knew TSM were on a big upswing. They, they are like the dominant team of North America, even though they weren't quite so dominant last year. Uh, they still have held the most NA uh, trophies by a significant margin. It only took until last year before they finally won to an actual finals uh so it's it's always it's always good money to put on tsm i feel like but this team liquid squad hats off to them they were able to pull it out i believe they didn't actually win a, a single game versus tsm until that right. game three and then they reverse swept them so they're actually three and four versus tsm uh this split both losing both regular season games and the first two games of this so Hats off to them, hats off to them. <laughs> he says that bitterly. <laughs> a little bit, of course. Um, we have to talk about that moment in the game that might have swung it in T um, Team Liquid's favor, right? The Zven. In game five, it seemed like TSM uh, had a nice uh, little lead there, and then Zven were a little too yes. far, a little too aggressive at Baron. <laughs> Is that really yeah. the moment you think that everything turned, or was there more to it than just, you know, Zven getting a little too far and being too aggressive? Um. I mean, you can obviously always point out uh, to the fact that the sidewave management in North America is actually historically been pretty bad compared to other regions. It's always been the international difference between them and other teams. Uh, and in that game, it was no exception, particularly in early games. Game 3, for example, could have definitely been over earlier if they had decided to play side lanes out with a pretty strong composition that they had going there for that purpose. But uh, in that particular game, yeah, that was definitely a turning point. Uh, Akali was really, really far ahead in that series, and I think if you just focus uh, hard on doing a full one and leaning towards her and really empowering Broken Blade, who I think had a phenomenal series, if it wasn't for the fact that uh, Team Liquid won, he would definitely have been the MVP. Uh, he only played in Turkey beforehand. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a proud German, though, I believe, and he... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's amazing how much he's done in his first split in, in like such a big arena. But yeah, when, when that happened, it was really difficult for TSM to set up the map favorably for uh, their Akali. Uh, Akali could never really push out too much without Team Liquid being able to kind of threaten to collapse on them, like G2 were permanently collapsing in their series, for example, in their game too. Uh, so yeah, that, I, I would definitely say it was the turning point. Uh, giving up Baron's always a big turning point. But against a composition that does want to hold side lanes like TSM's did, yeah, that that can be the game. You know, on the topic of Broken Blade, we gotta talk about this guy a little bit. I'm curious, did you ever hear about Broken Blade before he got picked up by oh, TSM? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was, so he was a, he was a really well-known rhythm one trick for a while. Um, but he, Aren't he's obviously all, yeah. diversified. He's all obviously diversified from that uh, since then. Uh, but he was definitely one of these like really strong mechanical players that everybody knew was kind of coming up, uh, and everyone was thinking was going to be part of this next line of big uh, mm -hmm. EU top laners. Like I can, I can add names like uh, Yoppa, for example, and the Rome to that. Uh, Sakra, Ice Beast. So these guys are like kind of like the top lane names that people know uh, is coming up and will be like a big thing in Europe soon. Finn actually got a uh, starting position in EU LCS on the team Rogue. That didn't win a single game until they took <laughs> Finn in and then they actually managed to win games. Uh, so he's alre already proving uh, the strength of a good top laner here. And obviously TSM nab Broken Blade before any of the EU teams mm -hmm. uh, in the LEC could nab Broken Blade. So there's some of a <laughs> 
Reginald's money uh, popping off there. <laughs> and yeah, you can see what uh, what we were all seeing for a long time, that this guy is a really confident player. Uh, you can always tell when you're watching solo queue games who the next big guys will be, because they're the guys who initially you would say are having like inconsistent games as they're rising up when they're not so good yet. But the reason that they're so inconsistent is because they are so committed to whatever decision they make. Like if, if Broken Blade thought that he wants to kill this guy, he'd, he'd be willing to chase this guy to the tier 3 tower to kill him, you know? <laughs> and eventually he'll figure out how to do it without having to feed so much, you know? And, and, that, and that's how it went in his development. And, and, he's a, and you could see that confidence come out in this series. And I, I really wish that they'd won the game for him, even though obviously the only, only player there that I really had any sort of previous relation to was Sven. Mm -hmm. uh, he was really trying so hard to win uh, his first title in his first split. And uh, yeah. I really hope he gets it next split. Yeah, even though they, they lost the series, he might even still, like, he might deserve the MVP award still. He was playing so well, and, like, he dominated Impact probably four out of the five games. Yeah. So it was really impressive. Um, also in this series, there were, I mean, it wasn't like the G2 series where they had like, some crazy drafts, but there was some weird stuff, too. I mean, Bjergsen oh, played yeah. Lux in game two. Um, Team Liquid tried to counter Ash or uh, Sonoteric with Ash Zyra. <laughs> so what do you think of some of this stuff? I mean, I know it wasn't uh, another funnel comp from G2, but still some pretty weird stuff that we haven't seen in a while. There was also the Heimerdinger in game one yeah, that the game one. out that didn't work, but I think the theory behind it is pretty good. They're bringing it out as a counter to Zoe. Uh, you can definitely match Zoe's burst. You have pretty incredible siege potential, and you have very strong control of neutral objectives, which is something that Zoe normally gives you uh, when you have the Heimerdinger, and you obviously deny her really hard mid-priority to actually contest any neutral objectives early on. Uh, so I really liked that from Jensen. Uh, it could have worked out. Uh, obviously, it didn't work out in that series, but the three behind that was good. Uh, the Ash Zyra is a North American classic. Cloud9 in Season 3 uh, made that pretty famous. Yeah. It's a really strong laning all-in composition at level 6, but it has a really strong laning phase before that. And against Sonotaric, you want a really, really strong laning phase, like G2 had when they had the Zyra Khan, and then they decided not to actually lane against the Sonotaric. But these are the kinds of picks that you do want against it. Uh, there's a team in uh in Europe called uh, Devils One, which was the first team in the world to actually beat the Sonotaric composition. And they were doing it with Varus and then dive displacement picks like Zack. Uh, so they were doing it with these kinds of things. You would link them and then, then you would dive them and you'd separate the Sona and Taric and you'd kill them off that way. And you just keep killing them off to delay their uh, two item power spike, which is the point where they become a really unstoppable force. It's not like a completely lane dominant pick. So that's why you end up with champions like Ash Zyra being the picks against them. So I really, really like that from them. Uh, and again, it's a North American classic. <laughs> and the Lux versus Zoe. Uh, Zoe's pretty susceptible to skill shots. She's actually a very, very low mobility pick, despite what her ultimate might uh, give the kind of impression of a lot if you're playing against her. But the moment she uses her ultimate, you know exactly where she's going to be. And, uh, and the Lux is a really, really good way to abuse that. It's not exactly something that I would have picked, but there were a lot of really squishy uh, low mobility targets on Team Liquid's composition at the time. That's when they brought out the Ash Zyra. Zyra is very squishy uh, so she had she had a lot of a uh, leeway of, about who she wanted to target in the mid to late game and yeah obviously that worked out for them as well and at that point i thought the series was completely one if they can bring up picks like this and win well not the case there it goes team surprise. Was a <laughs> surprise right yeah crazy news. all right veteran sadly that's all the time we have with you thank you so much for joining us today to break down the finals okay thank you very much for having me we'll Anytime. talk to you later we'll talk to you later all right, Matt, so we have a couple more things that we should talk about. First up, Team Liquid at MSI. Yes. How do you think they will do stacked up against all the other teams? I mean, G2's got all the hype behind them right yeah. now, right? After that 3-0 that swoop against Origin, they're the ones that everyone's looking at to maybe compete against SKT and whatever Chinese team it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but Team Liquid, automatically there's a couple of question marks, right? Because it wasn't exactly the cleanest series. TSM definitely exploited them in a couple of things. The first two games, hardly in their favor. And then even in game three and five, they're back against the wall a little bit, and it took them a little bit of, um, you know, running the same composition over and over to actually have success against TSM. I mean, we saw X Smithy run Skarner three games in a row. We saw um, them fall back on the Tompkins to try to protect double lift. So if other teams take that away, uh, which, you know, regional teams will definitely, or international teams will definitely do after watching this final, they'll be ready for Team Liquid strategies. 
Um, so, you know, I'm not as convinced about G2. I think G2 is a much better team. Team Liquid's definitely going to be, you know, Less taking a, definitely lower expectations, much lower wow, expectations. Wow, interesting. Because you think Team Liquid are basically just a protect double lift comp, and if that's removed, they don't have much else I mean, offer? that's kind of what they they went to. Um, they oh. tried some some interesting things. I mean, they tried Jensen on hybriding, as we spoke about with Veteran. Yeah. Um, they did try, you know, er, in the early stages to just get double lift on a Sivir or an Ash and, and make plays with, with those kind of characters. But instead, they had to default them back to Varus and just give them protection. Yeah. And then once they did that, they finally found success and he was dumping out damage. And we'll have to see. But I think I think Team Liquid does kind of have a, a one-off play style where it does normally revolve around double lift. Yeah. Occasionally, Jensen can pop off. Occasionally, Impact can pop off like we saw in Game 3 on Gangplank. But it really is... It is his team, right? He's won his sixth title now. He's he's the winningest player in NALCS history, yeah. which is weird to say after when he was on CLG, he had that empty trophy case, and now he's got now a back. loaded trophy case. So <laughs> uh, qu quite a transformation, but I do think this team still runs through him, and if other teams attack that bot lane, uh, they'll probably have pretty good odds of beating. All right, now it's time to pick our player of the week. So Matt, who do you got? I really want to give it to Broken Blade. I, I, I really do, but I you can't really give oh, it to so a you're losing not player. It to him. <laughs> I, I want to, but it's against the rules of player where you're of go. the week. It's okay. against the rules. It's not allowed. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm gonna give it to X Smithy. I think he was the reason for Team Liquid's turnaround in those final three games. I mean, his Skarner play was absolutely perfect on his journey to winning his fifth title, now second most tied with Bjergsen. And he was just always in the right place. He had counter ganks locked down. Uh, the, his timing was amazing. He found the perfect person to pull back in. Even in game five, when the enemy team was had entirely QSSs, he was able to draw that out and then get the pullback on his Skarner. So I really just think it was his passing, his play, his his calm mind that really allowed Team Liquid to get back into the series. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now he's right next ne with double lift. Just one step behind in trophies. So, you know, not many people talk about Xmithy on this team. Yep. He's kind of lost under the star power. But I do think he was the guy who really helped him out in the series. All right. Well, there you have it. Xmithy is. is our player of the week. And it's wrapped. The spring split is, is <laughs> over. But now we have MSI to look forward to. Yeah. We'll have to see how Team Liquid and G2 and all the other teams perform on the international stage. Well, tomorrow we have AJ and Ron back here to chat week two of the Overwatch League. So until then, hit us up on our socials at Squad State, and we'll see you tomorrow.